So this paper primarily focuses on Roman frontiers in Scotland and her interpretation has and continues to be affected by the theoretical approaches of past archaeologists as well as a lack of widespread application of modern technologies such as LIDAR and GIS uh, which limits the potential interpretation of Roman sites in Scotland. At the heart of this paper is the argument that we, academics and archaeologists, need to need to deploy multiple approaches, both theoretical and technological, in our analysis of Roman frontiers, particularly in Scotland, where such approaches have not yet been applied on a wider scale. While there have been surveys and excavations of individual sites, the vast majority of the 300 plus known and suspected Roman sites in Scotland are unexplored and unexamined beyond the initial identification. This is probably the best known Roman frontier in Britain, if not the world, although I'm sure my German colleagues with their Limes would disagree. Um, but Adrian's Wall is often regarded as a frontier, but what is meant by that? In some regards, it is a line in the sand, the northernmost limit of the empire marked by a giant wall, originally constructed from turf in the western section before being re rebuilt in stone, and large ditches on either side along with towers and forts built into the wall itself. But the reality is that it wasn't the edge of the empire. To the north were at least five forts, Birrens, Netherby, Bewcastle, Risingham and High Rochester, which have yielded evidence of Hadrianic occup occupation and were probably in use when the wall was garrisoned. The image on the left is a clear display of the wall as a giant barrier with the vallum relegated to a lesser monument to the top right of the image. We're not working. Oh well, we didn't find the vellum. <laughs> uh, the idea of Hadrian's Wall as a linear barrier is one which has persisted throughout history, <coughs> and indeed many people today think that the wall follows the line of the Scottish-English border. While Hingley, over there, so blame him, not me, has noted the proposal from the 1580s made to Queen Elizabeth I of England which sought to rebuild the wall and divide the two countries. Well, the purpose of the wall has been and continues to be debated. Uh, the Historia Augusta records that it was constructed to keep the barbarians out of the empire. Um, it's been this singular mention which has continued to influence and dominate the interpretation of the wall into the modern era. Scotland, as we've seen earlier, has its own physical frontier, the Antonine Wall, which was constructed around 8142 and replaced Adrian's Wall for a period as the northernmost edge of the empire. It consists of a wall of turf and ditch on the northern side interspersed with forts and towers. And unlike Adrian's Wall, the Antonine Wall was constructed solely from turf and its design is much more uniform. There are minimal changes in its design and materials and little evidence of outpost forts occupied at the same time. In this respect, the Antonine Wall lends itself much more to the traditional view of a frontier, a linear barrier potentially designed to keep invaders out of imperial territory. Unlike Hadrian's Wall, though, its northern counterpart has never really been seen or used as a barrier in the post-Roman period. Once the Antonine Wall was abandoned and Hadrian's Wall reoccupied somewhere around AD 162, the former ceased to have any function and indeed virtually disappears from history until the 17th century. Although there is a mention by Matthew Paris in the 13th century where he notes that the wall once separated the Scots from the Picts. While both walls clearly had a defensive role, they marked the zone which was the edge of the empire. Although for the Antonine Wall, this appears to have been a much more immediate space in the vicinity of the structure, while for Hadrian's Wall, it seems to have extended to 20 or 30 miles further northwards. So, how do we interpret frontiers which have no linear or physical barriers? There we go. Uh, stretching across Perthshire, the gas ridge is argued to be one of the earliest Roman land frontiers. Dating to the Flavian period <clears throat> and constructed sometime in the 80s, 70s or 80s, it comprises of a series of Roman forts, fortlers and towers, with a Lidri fortress at each two the, at the northern end of the chain. So the black one at the top. Um, the wooden towers are spaced at regular intervals along a Roman road heading northeast. That's this chain there. Um, the map here shows the course of the road, and once across the River Tate at Bertha, the route is lost, although Wollaskroft and Hoffman of the Roman Gas Project, which we saw in Becky's presentation, 
actively using old maps and aerial photographs to trace the road further north. Uh, GIS viewshed analysis has indicated a missing tower on the north bank of the river, which would enable signalling as far as Weedry Fortress, so Bertha and further north up to Woodhead. Some archaeologists have argued against labelling the Gas Ridge as a frontier, partly because of a lack of physical barrier, but also because there are fortifications beyond the immediate area of the central road and its structures. Indeed, as the map shows, there are fortifications along the Highland Fault Line, which is up there, and on this one, the grey boxes. Uh, currently, these are all believed to date the Flavian period, although datable evidence itself is lacking, and instead they've been classified by size or gate entrance structure <coughs> as belonging to the same period. This corresponds with limited avail information available in the classical tests, sorry, text, specifically Agricola by Tacitus. Um, but as a caveat, it should be noted that there are a number of other invasions that are on record, again, as we saw in Becky's presentation, um, particularly the third century Severan campaigns, which may have followed a similar, similar route up the northeast of Scotland. What is worth noting is that the Leedry Fortress, which was never completed and likely to have been abandoned around AD 86, along with the rest of these fortifications, is rather more remote from the other forts. Uh, nearby is the small fort lit at Cargill, and just beyond that, Stracathro, around 12 miles to the northeast, it's the square uh, just beyond uh, Strudel there. Um, does a lack of a physical barrier diminish the gas status as a frontier? In a word, no. It is a, still a heavily fortified zone. The main road in the central area is overlooked by towers at intervals of about a quarter mile or so. And like Hadrian's Wall, there are outposts located along the edge of the highlands, possibly near the entrances to the glens of valleys which lead into the heart of what was classed as barbarian country in the highlands. Not much has changed. While camps are located along the southeastern road, uh, southeast of the road, uh, and beyond the permanent fortifications, one hypothesis is that the camps were constructed first as part of the initial move northwards, followed by the road to aid quick movement through a region which is rugged and marshy. Um, the road was undefended and subject to attack by barbarians, which led to the construction of the towers to defend the road while the glens were while the forts were built near the glens to prevent barbarian incursions. We're lucky in Scotland to know um, a lot about Roman sites. As I said earlier, we have over 300. 150 of these are confirmed are likely Roman camps, um, seen here in a distribution map um, by Becky Jones. However, we don't actually know much about them beyond their defences and entrances. Relatively few have been surveyed or excavated, and, uh, with the exception of a handful of notable examples, such as Kintour in Aberdeenshire, which was extensively uh, excavated at the beginning of the millennium in advance of development. We are also lucky to have discovered at least one camp, well, two camps now, as um, was said in Becky's presentation, one in Ayrshire and the other in Aberdeenshire, which apparently have no defensive ditches or banks. Um, as surprising as this sounds, it's actually stated in Vegetius, who was writing around the late 4th century, that the army had abandoned the bank and ditch defences for camps. Um, as yet, the camp in Ayrshire is undated, and the one in Aberdeenshire is a little sketchy on the dates. Uh, to give an idea of the state of Roman research in Scotland, I want to just briefly again mention Becky Jones's work, um, her seminal work published in 2011. The chart uh, that Jones compiled showed that 82% of camps in Scotland were discovered through aerial survey, primarily undertaken in the post-war period with the most extensive number of discovery of Roman sites, not just camps, recorded by St. Joseph, followed by Maxwell and the Wallace Croft, with contributions from Crawford and Barry Jones. It's St. Joseph, though, who discovered the most sites from the air. Um, and before he, when he discovered the sites, he followed this up, usually with a small trench, just to confirm that it was a Roman site. Um, very little datable evidence has come out of these. Uh, and since then, there has been little further exploration of most sites. A small number have been subject to geophysical survey, 
And some have been extensively excavated, but usually in the early parts of the 20th century or through um, developers uh, wanting to build on the sites. Jodes used archaeological records and aerial photographs and surveys to compile a GIS analysis of every site in Scotland. Um, that's Burnfield that she did. Um, uh, I apologise for this. I thought on Saturday this was a great idea to include book covers. It's now the fifth one you've seen today. <laughs> <laughs> I have more books than anyone else on my picture, though. <laughs> um, it's the first time, it's Becky Jones's work was the first time the GIS analysis was used to plot the known or suspected dimensions of camps in Scotland mm. on a large scale. Willescroft and Hoffman have also published a volume which combines theoretical methods with archaeological evidence in 2009. Their book, Rome's First Frontier, says how the arguments that the Gasco Ridge is the earliest land frontier in the Empire and they've undertaken geophysical surveys of all the Flavian forts in North Scotland, including in Struval. While these books are extremely valuable and provide a useful contribution to our knowledge of Roman Scotland, they were both written almost a decade ago. Putting aside work on the Antonine Wall, most of the substantial text, written texts are books rather than journal articles. Um, and the research on Roman Scotland uh, was mainly done uh, many years ago, for example, McDonald's The Roman War was 1911 and republished 32. Newstead was done in 1911. Burns was 1975. Uh, Maxwell and Hansen's Rome's Northwest Frontier, another seminal work, was 1984. The time is now right for us to adjust the research agenda for Roman Scotland to begin to analyse and reanalyse the frontiers using the full armoury of modern technology available to archaeologists and academics on a large scale. So what could we possibly learn from deploying technology in our approach to the understanding of frontiers in Scotland? Um, here we can see the so-called Glenbocker forts, a series of forts located along the Highland Line. So you all know what hills look like if you're archaeologists. The description of Glenblockers appears to have originated um, from Richmond who excavated Fennoch in the middle in the 1930s. Um, he observed that that fort appeared to be blocking the entrance to a valley or glen which led into the highlands and that it was built in that location to defend the empire from the incursion of barbarians. A number of forts have had this label applied to them and while there has been some debate as to their purpose, whether it's defensive or offensive, they are now generally referred to as the highland line of forts. Topographical data has always been available, but it has been used little in relation to the positioning of these forts, as can be seen on the GIS map, there are a number of potentially insecure routes through the glens. This particularly true at Strakathro, which is here, and you've got an unguarded glen here. You've got various routes. There's actually a road heads over the pass there, um, which is also undefended. Strakathro is the most northerly known Roman fort. And if we assume, as archaeologists have done, that the camps are temporary and not likely to be occupied, then any invasion force would be able to travel down the valley and pass around ray dikes. So here we have temporary camps. Any invasion force can come through that glen and round, which makes it rather insecure than trying to uh, enter imperial territory. I should know that Care House Camp is currently created <coughs> Uh, by typology rather than from artefacts to the Severan period. Um, so that really comes off it. Um, uh, uh, and it also indicates that there may be a possible missing fort at Stonehaven or that the camps may have been occupied on a more permanent basis to protect the northern flank of the frontier. So Stonehaven is there. There's some good river access. Uh, further inland and it's on a natural bay. Um, I suspect there probably is something there. We just have to find it. Uh, this demonstrates by point as the examples show the contrast in identifying the orientation of camps. Around 82% of camps have been identified as crop marks and aerial photographs and sometimes um, okay, ignore that paragraph. I've pinched it from somewhere else. <laughs> it was a slip up. 
let's move on to intervisibility. Using the latest satellite topographical data, which is much more accurate than the old Ordnance Survey height data, it is possible to test theoretical approaches such as Woolacross analysis of signalling on the Gasp Ridge. Uh, the GIS analysis of the site does show their intervisibility and confirms these results. Our interpretation of forts and camps in the landscape has become very prescriptive. We think of one as being part of a permanently manned military infrastructure, while the other was temporary, a temporary means to an end, securely housing soldiers travelling from one point to another. The north of Scotland was an area never fully assimilated and occupied by the Romans, so camps were an integral part of the military infrastructure of this proto frontier, as we saw in the previous slide. As we can also see here, the Dunning camp forms a central part of the signalling system. Um, Woolescroft tested signalling between forts and towers that did not include the camps, and his analysis of signalling arrangements has indicated that there should be a relay station to the northwest, so somewhere up there where the arrows are going downwards. Um, when including the presumed Flavian camp at Dunning, it is clear that most towers uh, would have fulfilled this relay role, perhaps indicating that the structures weren't quite so temporary and more important than generally assumed. So what I'm saying is camps aren't temporary installations. They may have been permanent on some basis. Um, the application of GIS analysis to Flavian sites in the north of Scotland is giving, giving us greater insight into military activity in the area enabling us to go beyond theoretical approaches into the reality on the ground. Fortification should be orientated towards the enemy, according to Vegetius and Tajinus. So if indigenous sites can be identified around Roman fortifications, it could be argued that the Roman surveyors are doing what the Roman military writers later say they should. This argument becomes even stronger if the indigenous sites are strategic strongholds immediately in front of Roman forts. There are, however, a number of things to be considered, considered and overcome with this strategy. The indigenous site would need to be dated to and occupied at the same time as the Roman ones. There's no evidence of this happening in Scotland. The orientation of the Roman site would have to be identified, which is easier to calculate with northern forts and camps as they're only occupied during the Flavian period. And finally, what is the definition of a, an enemy site? Is it a strategic stronghold which can pose a threat? Or something more symbolic. So are the theories regarding positioning of fortifications correct? How many sites face the enemy? In the north of Scotland there are 46 sites in 29 locations and only 13 of those are facing indigenous forts. 23 are not facing anything that's known. While the majority of indigenous sites are undated, experts argue that they were abandoned long before the arrival of the Romans. And curiously, the majority of these indigenous forts are significantly small, um, all being less than 0.4 hectares in size, so not much of a threat. I want to quickly look at GIS and LIDAR. This is a GIS LIDAR analysis of inch 2 the Leisure Fortress, around 55 hectares in size, uh, and which has remained relatively free from modern development. So, there are the defences of it. There's a couple of camps nearby and a few other bits and pieces. It's located on a promontory and there's been some river erosion to the north side of the site where the defences have disappeared. Um, so just cutting off the edge there. Um, it's not clear this happened during or after the Roman period. And the image also shows a number of river channels which you can see there, and it's probable that the River Tay has moved course several times in the past 2,000 years. Old maps of several northern Roman sites show erosion from similar movements of the rivers. There is also some speculation that the course of the Tay was to the north of the fortress in the river period, and despite these river networks visible on the LIDAR, this is the reality today, one channel running to the south of the peninsula. Unfortunately, LIDAR data in Scotland is extremely limited, um, given that the main tranche has been gathered by the Environment Agency, who focused on river flooding. Um, only occasionally do Roman sites appear, such as this one, which is Bertha on the River Tay. Um, really need to do some more work on it. The fort is here. You can just make out what is probably the road crossing over the river. Further analysis 
has shown that 86% of Palladian sites have been constructed next to waterways, sensible option given the supply of fresh water and potential food sources, uh, essential to sustain an invading force. Positioning on rivers, uh, positioning sites on rivers would make them easy to locate if the river valleys were being followed, making a quick route to the interior, particularly for an invading force which has not yet established their own network of roads. Although I do want to make clear that although, although river levels were different in the Roman period, I'm not suggesting the army was travelling deep into the heart of Scotland by boat. Certainly many sites could be reached by travelling on the water in flat-bottomed vessels. Um, but today there's no evidence for jetties, piers or landing stages in any river estuary in Scotland. Um, I do believe the construction of fortifications on major rivers and their tributaries was deliberate. Although stylized, the next couple of slides will show uh, maps with uh, Roman sites in relation to rivers. Towers that we've got, which is the red circles, uh, tend to be on smaller rivers and large streams, while all of the, all of the known Flavian sites in the area have been plotted on the maps, even those not specifically next to water. The Solway Firth sites have direct and indirect access to the estuary, although how navigable it was during the Roman period is a separate question, because today it's a lot less accessible with the sands of the Solway Firth. Uh, this is the Clyde Estuary and River, uh, which is particularly long. It has many major tributaries fe feeding into the main body, and certainly travelling to the interior along the rivers would have led soldiers far inland. Crawford, down at the bottom there, is very close to Carlisle, probably about 20 miles away. Um, Firth of Tay, which goes back to the uh, towers and the gas ridge, um, it's a major river, and from at least the 18th century, seagoing vessels have docked as far as Perth, which is just south of Bertha on that. Sailing further inland is a challenge because of rapids, um, a place called Campsie Lynn. Although there's a 19th century newspaper account of some people um, who had some issues crossing over that in a small boat, but it does indicate that it's navigable. That's it up there. Um, LIDAR analysis indicates that the area around the Lynn has been carved out, although it's not possible to say whether that's caused by water or human activity, and certainly on the ground there's been human intervention in the landscape, with a religious house noted on the early maps on the south side of the, the Campsie Lynn, and there's evidence of stone jetty-like structures uh, stretching into the river, which aren't overly clear in that picture. So in conclusion, there are many opportunities to look at the Roman frontiers in Scotland in a new light using the existing data alone. Uh, the analysis which I've already undertaken in my research indicates that there are still many questions out there to be answered and possible gaps in the defences of the frontier, particularly the northern flank of the Gasco Ridge. Uh, with increasingly affordable technologies such as LiDAR drones, which my university is yet to purchase, <laughs> Notice Newcastle has them. Um, <laughs> it is going to be possible to scan more sites quickly and efficiently. For many of the camps and forts discovered by St. Joseph and the others, this will be the first opportunity to really analyse these sites and answer questions about construction, dating and purpose. Many theories have been put forward regarding the purpose of these frontiers and it's now becoming technologically within our grasp to start testing and confirming these but it does need a step change in how we, as archaeologists and academics, approach this work. Scottish Roman archaeology and academia is becoming thin on the ground, as Jones has alluded to previously today. Um, and those in senior positions, which were um, maybe generously described as being in their 40s, are soon rapidly approaching retirement age and not being replaced. It makes it increasingly difficult to see how research will continue. It would be a shame for frontier studies in Scotland, as well as elsewhere, to be on the cusp of a new era, new era with new ideas and possibilities, but for there to be nobody to actually undertake the work. Thank you. <laughs>